Never preach the gospel to a drunkard. Um, didn't really know how to title this to make sense of it, but um, you don't ever preach the gospel when you know that the person that you're trying to preach to is drunk or under the influence of drugs or something that puts them out of their normal state of mind. Okay. I uh, got a letter a while back and from a viewer and asked the question, should you preach the gospel to someone who is drunk? And uh, the answer is very obviously no. Okay. Um, I have actually experience with this. Um, as I've told the story, if you've been around the ministry for a long time, we had a neighbor that was a Roman Catholic. And he, uh, not a very good Roman Catholic, I guess, but uh, he was a drunk. That guy was in, just drunk all the time. And I mean, literally all the time. And there were a couple times when he was drunk where the Bible was brought up and we started talking about spiritual stuff and whatever. Because, you know, I, I had to, it was a right of way to get back to my property and I had to go right past his place. And he'd be out, hey, you know, stop pulling. And I'd come over there and we'd get to talking about things and whatever. And, and a couple times spiritual things were brought up, but he was drunk. And the one time he told me a story about when he was in Vietnam, how he got really wasted the one time. Um, and, uh, you know, Vietnam, the war, I'm saying. And if you can't figure that out, and he was with the Air Force, and he got really drunk and went out of the, you know, officer's club or whatever and fell down, just passed out drunk or something. And uh, I don't know what rank he was or whatever else, probably not very high because you can't get real drunk if you're an officer like that. But the whole point is, he said he felt that he was going into hell. He said he felt... The, the heat from the flames and whatever and he and he cried out and, and prayed and said God please uh, give me another chance don't send me to hell and he said I was never so scared in all my life and he said you know that he came out of it and whatever and went back to drinking again like a drunk still and so not really that smart of an individual but I literally had to wait for, I think it was two years before he was finally sober enough where I could actually preach the gospel to the guy. But I mean, that the the one time that he was telling me that story, I mean, he was crying and I, you know, I don't know, I, I didn't, I was so scared of going to hell. It would have been a great chance for me to preach the gospel, but he was drunk. There's no way I'm going to preach to a drunk man. And ironically, the one time he actually had a devil spirit manifest, um, when he was drunk and I was there and, and we were talking and things and, and he was, you know, talking and he's doing a thing, you know, he's just drunk. And then all of a sudden he just stopped and he looked at me and he said, I know who you are. You're a preacher of righteousness. You know, and it was this totally different voice. Weird. And again, you know, I'm not going to, you know, preach the gospel to a, a devil either, a devil spirit. And so I, you know, not going to get into all the stuff that happened there that day, but the whole point is when I finally came the one time and he's sitting there drinking coffee in the morning, which was very unique, but, uh, and he was completely in his right mind and I preached the gospel to him and he said, oh, he said, I knew a Baptist years ago and he said, he preached the same thing. And I said, well, because it was the truth, Tom, I said, uh, you know, you need to get saved. And he said, I will never believe what you believe. Never. I won't do it. Okay. And uh, I walked away and I said, Lord, thank you for that opportunity to finally get the gospel clearly presented to him. You know, the Bible says, Tom, that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried and he rose again the third day. You know, I mean, everything. And it wasn't, you didn't do it right or something. No, he didn't want it. That's the whole point. Um, I mean, I've seen people that got saved and the gospel presentation that they tell me about wasn't even that great. <laughs> um, so it's not about the words that you speak. It isn't some kind of a thing of you say it just the right way. You have your gospel presentation you know, ready to go and, and you can get people to pray the prayer and then you walk away saying, I got another one saved. No, um, it's about the person. It's about the Holy Spirit uh, putting that conviction there of sin and, you know, them truly wanting to be saved. It's not really about you as a Christian. Um, and if you're going out there and you're trying to do your soul winning stuff and whatever, 
uh, you're wasting your time. Um, you know, quite frankly, a lot of this forced soul winning stuff, you know, you have to do it to prove that you're a good uh, church attending Baptist or whatever. He's a soul winner. Uh -huh. Yeah, more like you're going out getting people to pray false prayers where they end up turning against the Lord later on in life um, because you did something that confused them and forced them into making a decision that they didn't truly believe in. Uh, you're not proving anything uh, when you get into that stuff. It's not of the Lord. Uh, please be very careful about that. But um, I'll give you a verse of scripture here. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, speaking about dealing with Christians, but um, I think it applies for, you know, instruction and in righteousness, so to speak, for, you know, witnessing to people. Um, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. Um, if you're preaching the gospel to somebody that's drunk, there's a sense in which you are being a partaker of their sin. All right, you are essentially saying, uh, I think that you can make a logical, rational decision right now when you are clearly inebriated, you are clearly drunk, you are clearly on drugs or whatever, and you know, I'm going to use this opportunity to witness to you. Um, you know, it, it's wrong. It isn't not, it's not how it's supposed to be. Um, it'd be kind of like uh, some guy... Uh, sees a woman and she's drunk or whatever and and he goes and uh, you know fornicates with her in her stupor and then he says oh we're in love she loves me because we were together last night uh, no uh, she wasn't there to make a conscious decision um, sorry to use that as an example but I think it illustrates my point uh, some guy's drunk he's not you know drunk people will say all kinds of weird stuff and you can get them to, oh, it looks like they wanted to be saved or something, and they prayed a prayer. So they said that they believed in Jesus. Uh, yeah, drunks will say a lot of things. And um, so I, I don't know. I think it could be legitimate. You know, and then you get that whole thing, and I, get, I just get so sick and tired of that. And I can tell you, you know, I used to go door to door, you know, knocking people's doors and whatever to prove that I was a good Christian. And... Um, you know, uh, going along and, and, you know, you get these, I remember this one house we came to and, and this guy steps out in the front porch and he's got this big cigar and he's smoking and, and, um, you know, are you just out here to ask people today, if you died today, do you know if you go to heaven or whatever? And the guy just went, <laughs> yeah, he said, I've been through all that stuff, man. And, uh, I'm not interested. And, um, we said, and, oh, well, tell us about it. He said, yeah, he said, uh, um, we got to talking and he actually grew up in the Baptist church where we were, had just left. We started our house church at the time. And he said, yeah, he said, I used to go there before it blew up. <sighs> and it had, it had gone through all kinds of church splits and everything else. And, you know, so do you believe the gospel? Don't, don't waste your time. Okay. Um, I, I was through all that stuff. The victim of hyper soul winning, in other words. How tragic, how sad, and yet so many go through that whole thing. So, uh, long story short, um, should you witness to somebody who's drunk? No, you shouldn't. Uh, let them sober up. Maybe give them, say, hey, you know what, when you get out of that alcohol or you get off this drug high or whatever else, please read this. Give them a you know, gospel tract. I think that would be fine. But, oh. Um, tell you another story here quickly before I end this video. Um, my great grandfather was a Pentecostal preacher, one of the early Pentecostal preachers back in the, uh, I guess, late 1800s, um, early 1900s. When the, I guess it was more early 1900s. But um, uh, Pop Pop Campbell, they called him my maternal grandmother's father and um back in those years the pentecostals they believed in the doctrine of holiness and um they had st standards like you couldn't believe i mean if you were um yeah all kinds of things i mean uh, really tough dress standards and 
other things I know even up into the 19 probably 50s or so they were teaching that if you were in a movie theater when the rapture happened that you'd be left behind <laughs> I mean they were strict very strict not like your modern day Pentecostals I mean there's probably still some holiness ones around but not very many compared to the modern charismatic movement that came in and destroyed the Pentecostal whole thing but uh, the story went that my great grandfather um he was in, uh, they lived in Lancaster City, uh, down in Pennsylvania, um, back when it was a fairly decent city, as far as, you know, that not a whole lot of crime or whatever. But he said the one time he was out in front of his church building, and he said he looks and he sees this guy, you know, staggering down the road, and the guy walks right into a, a pole of some kind. I don't know what it would have been back in the early 1900s, maybe a... I guess they might have had electric back then. Whatever. But he walks into this pole. Bam! Hits the pole. And he steps back a step or two. And he takes his hat off. And he says, Excuse me, ma'am. Didn't see you there. <laughs> and and then walked out around it. And my great-grandfather went down. And he grabbed the man. And grabbed him by the arm. And he said, You dirty, filthy drunk. He said, You're coming into the altar right now. And he said, You're going to get right with God. And he said, Uh... He dragged him into his church building, took him up front, and he put him down there, and he said, now you start praying. He said, you, you can't live this kind of life anymore. He said, uh, you need to get saved. You start praying. <laughs> and uh, the story went that the guy, I guess, you know, made a profession of salvation and, you know, ended up being a faithful church member and whatever and uh, cleaned up his life. Did he get saved or not? I don't know. Um... I'd like to hope so. I'd like to think that he did. Um, but uh, you just be, need to be careful that these people are making the right decision. Um, again, you know, the, the guy could have just gotten into religion and cleaned up his life as a result of religious practice, which, you know, is better than the guy continuing as a drunk in some ways, but you still end up in hell. So what was the point? So, you know, well, I've, I've been witnessing to drunks and have great success and whatever. Um, well, that's between you and God. You can do what you want. But uh, my recommendation, wait till they're sober. Don't become partakers of their sins. Keep yourself pure. And by the way, if you're going down to where drunks are at, um, not a real good place to be. So... That is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.